tangible forms and processes and all input received through the senses qualify and inform thought and emotion and are the raw materials of rational experiential truth. Even misperceived input is a form of that truth to the perceiver. The language of mathematics and science is an utterly distinct and elegant idiom for the reassessment of arrival at and articulation of rational truth. But totally inseparable from and validated by external observable fact and the constancy and reliability of material reality. Imagination, thought, and emotion are the occupants of an alternate dimension that intertwines with material reality, a domain where anything is possible, contradictions cohabitate, and time and space are irrelevant, where the actualities and concrete truths which science and reason validate and empirical fact and physical reality tyrannize hold little sway. It is here that poetic truth abides. Poetry does not take as its purpose and or its responsibility the verification and validation of rational truth. Poetry shouldn't intend to start with either a true or valid premise and end with a proven or validated rational thesis. Its process is richer, more subtle and nuanced than the mere sequencing of rational, logical assertions in order to validate a concept or idea or prove or confine some preconceived or anticipatable and reassuring truth that subordinates itself to reason. Its purpose is to commandeer rational truth, transform it through the emotion, craft, and artistry of the poet, to become a new linguistic body for the metamorphosis of emotion, empirical fact, and sensory evidence into a quantum elevation of perception and recognition, to be the repository for and manifestation of a deeper, richer, more human truth, poetic truth. Poetic truth is felt, thought, intensified and fulfilled to a greater or lesser degree and from poem to poem by an aesthetic emotional rationale that varies with each poem and each poet's sensibility at work in each poem, created and defined by its own poetic logic, a commingling of rational and emotional assertions from line to line that become the elements of the internal, self-referential, poetic logic of each individual work, manipulated and defined at the urging of the artist by the quality of the language, the authority of the tools of craft, and the elegance and dexterity of sensibility at work, in order to assemble and present to the reader a world of internal emotional and intellectual references which, in their totality, when communicated and perceived, create and validate a new domain of poetic truth. Here are some thoughts from poets and scholars on how this commingling and reinvention in the poetic process arrives at the manifestation of poetic truth. T.S. Eliot said, The only way of expressing emotion in the form of art is by finding an objective correlative. In other words, a set of objects, a situation, a chain of events which shall be the formula of that particular emotion, such that when the external facts, which must terminate in sensory experience, are given, 
the emotion is immediately evoked. William Carlos Williams said, A poem is a small or large machine of words. When a poet makes a poem, makes it, mind you, he takes words as he finds them interrelated about him and composes them without distortion which would mar their exact significances into an intense expression of his perception and ardors that they may constitute a revelation in the speech that he uses. It isn't what he says that counts as a work of art. It's what he makes with such intensity of perception that it lives with an intrinsic movement of its own to verify its authenticity. Dorothy Sayers said, Allegory is the interpretation of experience by means of images. A great poetical image is much more than the sum of its interpretations. Samuel Taylor Coleridge said this, in poetry, in which every line, every phrase may pass the ordeal of deliberation and deliberate choice, it is possible and barely possible to attain that ultimatum which I have ventured to propose as the infallible test, namely its untranslatableness in words of the same language without injury to the meaning. Cheslaw Milos said, The purpose of poetry is to remind us how difficult it is to remain just one person. For our house is open, there are no keys in the doors, and invisible guests come in and out at will. I seek in poems a revelation of reality, of what is known in Greek as epiphany. Language must name reality, which exists objectively massive, tangible, and terrifying in its concreteness. The artist must have the distance necessary to transform this material artistically. The commingling and interdependency of external and internal points of reference and the manipulation and reinvention of experience through craft and language are the foundational elements of poetic process that ultimately lead to poetic truth. The poet delights in process, in service of its substance, because the brilliance of poetry and of each poem is the fulfillment of its process. Through language, idea, metaphor, simile, imagery, music, stress, visual and auditory construct. Marshall McLuhan, Canadian philosopher, teacher, and theorist, coined this phrase in the 1960s, the medium is the message. If I may mistranslate and reapply his words, for poetry, the process is the poem and its unique, irreducible poetic truth is the fulfillment of that process. Its poetic truth is in how the how creates the what. Thus, direct perception, emotion, and statement of fact like, for example, I feel alone, through poetic process can become I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. Or, I will cease to exist is transformed into, oh, as I was young and easy in the mercy of his means, time held me green and dying, though I sang in my chains like the sea. 
meaning much more on so many other levels with the richness of the illusory power of image and metaphor and music resonating in the mind of the reader and meshing the language of another heart and mind with the substantive and evocative associations and private references of the reader who connects with the power and depths of that other heart and mind speaking its poetic truth in ways newly experienced and as if it were the reader's very own. Gaston Bacillard said, in the realm of imagination, every eminence takes on a transcendence. Each contemplated object, each evocative name we murmur, should be the point of departure, a creative linguistic movement. A special kind of beauty exists which is born in language, of language, and for language. And James Joyce writes, Beauty, the splendor of truth, is a gracious presence when the imagination contemplates intensely the truth of its own being or the visible world. And the spirit which proceeds out of truth and beauty is the Holy Spirit of joy. These are realities, and these alone give and sustain life. Poetic truth inevitably arrives where language, on its brilliant collision course with objective reality, experience, perception, emotion, and craft, is transformed, clothed in the accoutrements of its artifice and its aesthetic eloquence. As writer and reader, from poem to poem, cohabitate each revelatory realm, savor each ever-varying and deepening resonance and intensity, where each articulation of its truth is codified and where each ultimately abides in the transcendent embrace of beauty. It is, as John Keats Earn utters to all of humanity in the final lines of his poem, Ode on a Grecian Urn, Beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. <laughs>